Hello, good morning. Happy Saturday. Welcome. Um, Elizabeth and I um, we get to introduce Charles Taylor to you guys today. So um, ask questions, please um, subscribe to wherever you're watching. I always forget to tell people to subscribe. Um, anyways, um, thank you for joining us on a Saturday. So we wanted to do something for the weekend warrior type people or the people that are, you know, I don't know, sitting around working and want to watch something at the same time. So, um, welcome Charles. Thank you very much for having me. Awesome. Elizabeth, welcome. How are you? I'm good. <laughs> so, all right. So anyways, um, Charles is an interesting story. Um, he came to spring training last year. We'll talk a little bit about that. Um, he's on the enterprise side of our world in the SEO world. And it definitely brings a whole different dynamic compared to a lot of us agency owners that have smaller, medium, even some larger clients. But um, it's interesting. One of the neatest things that I got to do last year was talk to talk to Charles about, you know, just different questions that, you know, might be in people's minds about, gee whiz, you know, I mean, you get a you get all these hits a month, you know, how do you control all this stuff and everything? And um, just super cool conversations. And then we also got to meet at a couple other events. And so we'll talk a little bit about Charles and his rise to fame this year, <laughs> so to speak. <laughs> but, um, but he's a God, he's so he's, he's an interesting guy. He's worked for a couple major freaking companies that he'll talk about, but um, ask questions, guys, these things are, uh, this is, this is what we like to bring to you guys are people that are in a different, you know, a different category or a different path than we are. Some people want to get into the enterprise type SEO. Um, some people like us have been there, probably don't really want to go back. So, you know, but um, ask your questions, guys. We'll get into this. Um, and then, um, yeah, this is going to be great. So anyways, Charles, tell us a little bit about yourself and yeah. how you got into this wonderful world. Yeah, no problem. So the first thing I always warn everybody is the grass is always greener on the other side. Uh, for those of us who, who are in enterprise, we, we look at the we look at the agency or the independent model and be like, wow, that would really be nice. And then I, I'm sure those of, those of you that are in the agency or independent, like, wow, it'd be great to work for a large company. That grass is always greener. The uh, the funny thing is that the SEO is not different, but what you end up focusing on is real different. Uh, when we make a mistake, if we if we just neglect to do something, we do end up doing at such a scale. That it really, really impacts us. So we can have, you know, a, a, a simple problem with an XML sitemap can end up being a real big problem for us. Uh, whereas for the typical site that may not be getting as hit as much by Google, um, it, you know, you could you could go down for for half a day or something, and it really wouldn't be that big of a deal. Um, but uh, on the reverse side, though. Um, we, you know, we get to, we get to see things at scale. We get that we get the benefit from the fact that Google's constantly hitting our site. So, just a <coughs> quick little like kind of Reader's Digest version of, of my of my story. I, I currently work. I'm the senior uh, uh, senior director of SEO for Fox Corporation. I've been there for almost three years now. Uh, before that, I was with a company uh, called Verizon, which probably most of you know. Was with them for a little over five years. Um, before that, I was with a, an e-commerce company for about five years, and that was a, a company that started relatively small but got pretty big. It was a company called Costume Super Center. We ended up actually they owned like ten or twelve different e-commerce sites, and they were costumes and party supplies and cupcakes and lingerie and you, you name it. They they did a little bit of everything. They even had an adult site in the mix, um, and that was an interesting one to um, to, uh, to optimize. Um, before that, I was I, I started out really in my uh, my career, my professional SEO career. Um, with a company called Lexus Nexus, and, and that was back in I guess 2007. That company and was really the company I worked for was Martindale Hubble, which was a division of Lexus Nexus. And what Martindale Hubble did is they did the books, uh, they did directories of lawyers. So if ever you go to a lawyer's office, they've got shelves full of books. Um, well, they used to always have shelves full of books. Fortunately, I haven't had to be in a lawyer's office lately. Nothing against lawyers, but. Um, I, when you go into the when you go into, used to go in the office, they had these books. A lot of them were just directories, and it was directories of other lawyers, and it was it was a way for them to find and connect with other lawyers. And around I guess 05, 06, they started using this thing called the internet, and they started asking questions of Martin. I was like, well, why do I have to pay twelve hundred dollars a month or whatever the ridiculous price they're paying for a book when I could just go on this thing called Google? And mm -hmm. um, the company <clears throat> had a panic, and they said, uh oh, for the first time in like one hundred and fifty years, the company had been around forever. 
their sales actually slowed. And wow. um, I was actually there when their sales went down for the first time, like a hundred and so years. And, and that was like a panic moment for everybody. So one of the things they want to do is they started building websites and actually trying to optimize. And I was one of the first people with that company. And that was very interesting because there you had an enterprise company bringing in a division that they knew nothing about. Um, and culturally, it was a huge um shock for both us coming in and for the folks working there for the folks that had this is how corporate america is supposed to work and then you had all these young kids coming in saying okay well we're just going to do this and we're going to do this and we're going to laugh and joke at work and then you have these other people that didn't you know that's not what you did you always wore the three-piece suit and the hat and well maybe not hats anymore but uh it was it was a very so that was a, that was my first taste of of of, uh, of of corporate and i was there for a couple of years um and that's when i moved on to the e-commerce was a smaller medium-sized company i said that maybe that's where i want to be and and then I, I got kind of pulled away from them by Verizon. Um, and then since then, I got I got recruited by um, uh, by Fox. That's kind of backwards and forwards of where I was. Before I did all that, I had had my own business for several years um, and uh, I built, ended up building. I kind of fell into, I always joke that you get into SEO out of inspiration or desperation. And mine was definitely mm -hmm. on the desperation side. I, I had a business. I was doing a lot of selling on eBay, Amazon. And I would hit some scares every now and again where someone would, you know, I'd get I'd get shut down for like a day or two days and I'd be like, I got to, you know, figure out a way to protect myself. So I started making my own website. And then after, I don't know, a month, of, a couple months having a website, I'm like, someone told me, oh, you have to have analytics. I'm like, what's that? So I put it on there. And then I saw this line that said organic traffic. Like, what does that mean? And someone explained it to me. And that was really how I started learning about it. And I started building affiliates. That was back in, I guess, I don't know, 04, 05. I started messing mm -hmm. around with that. And, and, um, decided to go legit in you know a couple of years did ago. you have any um kind of like side gig affiliate stuff you're doing now yes so. i do yeah I'm, I'm a little insane i do a little bit of everything so i my, my cool. day job my day job is, is is with fox i do um i do have a couple clients i work with um i have a there's a small agency who needs help with seo and i do consulting for them and then i have my own sites i, I have a couple of my own sites i run some are just tests some are just to, to see if i can you know build up and make something bigger and better uh build my cool. own kind of passive income so yeah, I do. I do too much. I do a little bit of everything. So I, um, I like doing the the client work on my own stuff because it kind of keeps me, keeps my hands kind of dirty, so to speak. It keeps my boots mm -hmm. on the ground. Whereas in an enterprise sites, it's easy not to touch. There's things I can't touch, quite frankly. Yeah, I, I, for sure. There's things I just can't. I just you know you couldn't have in a large organization. Everyone going onto the site and making changes. It has to be yeah. controlled. <clears throat> So it's nice to be able to do my own schema as opposed to trying to explain to somebody here's how you do schema or or doing my own you know canonical tags supposed to have to explain to me nope that's not how a canonical tag works this is how it works yeah. and re-explaining and re-explaining yeah one of my disclaimers i do when i talk about schema is that if you're in the enterprise world you're probably not going to get this stuff approved to put on the website <laughs> <laughs> so yeah it, it's it, well the hard part i find with, with things like schema and really seo in general is we can't optimize we can't customize individual pages very well mm -hmm. um, we have to come up with a template and this yeah. template has to work across the board and, and so we end up having to you know it's that 80 20 we have to find that 80 percent that that does everything and and um, mm -hmm. that's why i would say the smaller or smaller companies yeah you can it's hard to be a large organization because a lot you know we have this authority we have this massive authority we're going to get crawled constantly by google but we can't optimize to the level that a, that a smaller medium-sized company can optimize so for sure uh, there's definitely plenty of holes out there uh, optimize uh, SEO wise. Well, and it's, and you know, and it goes to say too, that, you know, I mean, you're, you guys and a lot of other people in that realm are traffic hogs. So, yeah. you know, and traffic is driving everything. So, you know, we would all love to have Fox's traffic and not worry so much about, you know, here's Bob and here's Joe and here's you know, <laughs> trying to pick off individual, you know, companies as we're moving up the, up the, up the ladder. But, um, you also mentioned about sitemaps and um, sitemaps to me is becoming even more important, especially with all this stuff going on with AI and all this other stuff. And one of the first things that I do in my audits is look at the sitemap, you know, and it's amazing how many discrepancies, how many errors, how many, how much stuff is in the sitemap that's either not there anymore I mean, it's just, you know, and unfortunately, people just don't pay attention to that. They just assume that they have a plug in or they have, you know, whatever, and they delete a page. Well, it's automatically going to delete the site map and they don't, you know, but that's one of the big things. And I know you and I have talked about how important the kind of the basic stuff, you know, I mean, 
back when I started SEO, you know, we lived on the robot.txt and sitemap. That was that was how we directed, you know, people to go or traffic to go and or bots to go. Um, and nowadays, I think it's just kind of like a just a forgotten thing. Just put it on the shelf. It's working fine. No need to check it, you know, type of thing. So but on your level, it's probably something you guys got to look at all the time. So, yeah, it's, it's site maps for us. There's two things you can know about enterprise companies with their site maps is that we're super important and they're always wrong. Like mm -hmm. I, I've I've come to the I've, I've we were just actually just doing a little UAT work uh, on on a, on a change that had to be had to be made. And uh, we ran into a problem. And then my first question wasn't, is there a problem? Um, mm -hmm. It was how bad is this problem? Like, is this, at, you know, we have a sitemap of 10,000 URLs. Are we talking about five URLs? We're we talking about a thousand plus URLs. And once you hit mm -hmm. that thousand plus, okay, now it's something we got to pay attention to. Is it the same problem over and over again? You've just, with, with enterprise, you just have to accept there's a certain level of error that's going to happen. For and sure. We're never going to fix it all. I, I, I love working on my own site when I have, you know, 20 or 30 pages and I find <laughs> I can just get in there. I can fix that. You know, you can go through all 30 pages, even a 50 to hundred page site. You can yeah. go through it manually in an afternoon. It's not that huge of a problem, but for um, sure, it, it's a scale thing, which is a problem. Now I'm going to give uh, the first nugget of the day for everybody that's listening is, <laughs> um, there's something else that's just as important as sitemaps. And I would say this is important for large or small companies. And I've talked about this in a few places, in a few of my presentations, and that's RSS feeds. And some of you may be sitting there thinking, RSS, Charles, is it 2012? And I'm like, yes, it is 2012 again. Google does hit your RSS feeds. Google likes them. Um, I am not sure why Google seems to like it. Did someone make a make an error in the code and <laughs> didn't realize they, they reactivated something? Is it is it a way for them to process? I suspect it's a way for Google to process a lot easier, a lot quicker and easier. So um, I would recommend everybody have a have a robust RSS feed. Use the um, use the validator. I think uh, W three Schools has a validator. I I always use it. Just make sure there's no errors, no warnings, um, and uh, put that uh, put that link in your header. Mm -hmm. We also put it and start starting to put it in the same as a schema. Mm, that's a good idea. So, I like that. Um, so, yeah. So, uh, you know, that's yeah, you're right. I mean, it, it's one of those things that, that we kind of keep an eye on. We know about I play a lot in the IFTT syndication side. So um, we kind of figure out which feeds we can kind of, you know, syndicate that way. Um, find out all these different things that Google's looking for feeds and they're out there. Um, you know, and that's another thing, too, There's it seems like Google's wanting a feed on every single page on your website. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and so when you're looking in search console and you're seeing all a lot of the pages that are, you know, crawled, not indexed, they're going to be feed pages. And they're really feed pages or RSS pages that really, I don't know why Google's looking for an RSS. It's a water heater page. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, but it's just, you know, it's, I think it's, you know, I think one of the things that, you know, you and I talk about a lot is that type of stuff is I don't test it enough to see, you know, but I have been following you and some other people, Ted, and some other people that talk about how important they are. So, yeah, we started playing with it and putting it in the schema. And I, I like the idea of putting it in the header. That's pretty cool. Yeah. So, so Google will check for the link alternate uh, tag in your header and mm -hmm. uh, you can put your you can put your RSS feed in there. Um, and um, yeah, I think Google checks it. My suspicion is, and I could be wrong. My suspicion is an RSS feed is is a is a structured markup like schema, mm -hmm. and it's a yeah. way for Google to process the page without crawling it. And exactly. I wonder, is Google cheating a little bit? Are they are they well? They could crawl the page and go through all that processing power, or are they saying, hey, if we can find schema and or an RSS feed that's giving us information, mm -hmm. maybe that's their first pass before they crawl the page. Um, I yeah, can be looking at RSS. It. If you look at an RSS feed page, it looks like an AMP page, the old yeah. AMP page. No images, no, you know, just quick text, you know, flip you've it on down. You've got the header, you've got the, you've got the body, you've got everything lined up there. Google doesn't yeah. have to deal with, you know, images and, and ads and comment sections. They don't have to deal with anything in there, which exactly. if I was a programmer, I'd be very happy to crawl that any day other than figure out what is the main content and what is not the main content of a page. Yeah. So consistently the path of least resistance. Yeah. Yes. So I've noticed, and that's one of the other benefits working with enterprise is we can see, because we see data at such mass scale, um, I'll also notice that Google has a lot of, I call them cheats, but they're shortcuts, they're ways to, they're ways to do processing so that they don't have, you know, so they don't have to figure out that, you know, so let's just take something simple. Uh, the date 
using the last modified date or last update date in schema is a great way for Google to figure out when was this page last updated as opposed to checking it's as opposed to getting the page, doing a diff in its database, mm -hmm. figuring out when's the last time I saw it. Okay. It must've changed. Like Google go through all that processing or it could just look at your schema, look at your last modified date. Uh, I yeah. don't know Google's doing that, but that's the kinds of things I'm seeing Google do where it'll have a little bit of a cheat saying, Hey, if this mm -hmm. is updated, that means this whole page must have been updated. Or if this wasn't yep. updated, that means this whole page must not have been updated. And they have lots of little things they do to, to I think, to cut down the processing. And I think that must be an edict within Google over the last couple of years. Like, what can we do to save processing time? Mm -hmm. oh, I agree. Okay. So then I have a question for you, Terry. Like, how often do you consistently go in and update schema? Because, like, I know for a lot of people that you have done projects for, it's typically a one and done. Or is it something that should be modified on a regular basis? Um, I mean, the, the last date modified, first of all, your sitemap should be set to last date modified. So most sitemaps out of the box are set up alphabetical. So your about page gets crawled every single time. So um, I don't really spend too much time, obviously, going back to all the schema and updating. We just updated the water heater page. So I'm going to go in the schema and put a last modified date there because it's already in the sitemap that it's the last modified. So, um, but I do agree a brand new page or everything else that, you know, we, again, we play with it, but again, I don't want to give Google the impression, at least on the last modified, unless it's automated, you know, that's the thing. If I've got to manually go into these 10 pages schema and change that date, um, you know, I, I don't know. It's just, I look at it more of a scale factor thing for me. So, um, but I, but I do know that having the date somewhere is super important. You know, whether you have your, whether you have it in your site map, I always show the time and date on the site map. I've always have, I, it makes sense to me, you know, Google would want to say, Oh, Hey, this is yesterday, you know, I'll crawl it. So, um, but again, yeah, it's, uh, just again, telling, telling the search engines, what was the most recent thing that happened to this website? I don't want to keep crawling the stuff that's been there for months or years or whatever. I want to just crawl what's new, you know? So if it's a new page, if it's a new blog, whatever, that's all I want to crawl. Cause we also don't get much time on site compared to somebody like Fox. You know, I wish we had a little chart there that says, Hey, you got 2.3 seconds on your, on your crawl. And you know, this local plumber got 0 0.003 seconds. You know? So we don't know how much time we get. So yeah, making it, easier for Google to crawl your site or any robots crawl your site to get the most accurate information. It's super important. So I, I would recommend um, something that, that most folks want to do if they really want to keep an eye on Google. Uh, so Screaming Frog has a great tool, Log Analyzer. Um, mm -hmm. You can download your logs. I, I, I do it for my own personal sites. I download my logs via FTP. I, I import them into Log Analyzer. You can see what bots are hitting what. Um, and yeah. actually that doing my own personal sites is when I started realizing the importance of certain pages like, like a robots.txt. So someone mm -hmm. may say, no, I want Google to hit everything on my site and there's nothing. So I'm not even going to bother. Why do a robots.txt? <laughs> Why even bother? Well, I noticed yeah. Google was constantly looking for a robots.txt on my site. Yeah. So this was years mm -hmm. ago. So I said, okay, I should always have one. And then I said, well, wait a minute, we can put a, a designation for our XML sitemap and RSS feed in a, in a robots.txt. So I did that. And then I wondered one day, does it really matter? So I ran a test to see, submit it. Uh, so there was there's three ways you can submit an XML sitemap. So I had three different mm -hmm. XML sitemaps, three different pages that could only be found by their individual XML sitemaps. I did one via uh, GSC, one via XML sitemap, and one via, um, I'm sorry, one via GSC. Uh, one was um, via the robots.txt, not, not the XML sitemap. Yeah. And then one, and I submitted one um, sitemap via, um, the ping command. There was mm -hmm. a ping command, which I think Google's just recently deprecated. Uh, so I don't think it works anymore. And what I expect. I, I still do it. I still. <laughs> yeah, I don't. I haven't if tried I, it. Especially if I make a whole bunch of changes to a site, I'll. I'll do the ping on the video and the and the XML site. Now. So so well, that's good to do because what I learned was that what I expected was the robust.txt. Google's hitting it constantly, so it's going to follow that. XML immediately, and mm -hmm. then GSC would be a little bit lower, and the ping would get to it whenever it got to it. I found the reverse. Ping was like worked almost right away. Mm -hmm. Google was hitting my sitemap within like an hour of me pinging, probably less. Same with GSC. So it was like GSC and ping were about the same. XML sitemap, it took 
or robots.txt, I mean, it took Google literally days to recognize the XML sitemap. So then I ran the test. Well, they, well, they, have, they have to come back to see that sitemap. They have to come but, back to see the robot.txt. But that's the thing. They were hitting my robots.txt every day. And they weren't oh, okay. hitting the, the, XML, the XML in there, which I found very, very interesting. Um, I, wonder, I wonder what they was looking for then. You know, maybe... Know. Just maybe, see they you know, maybe the, the negative directives to stay away from whatever. I, I think don't know. they were just checking oh. to see, should I can, should I be staying out of certain areas? Um, yeah. Now, with that said, they eventually picked up the XML within the ROS.txt. They crawled everything. Everything got indexed. Um, so from there, I've always thought to myself, all right, definitely resubmit via Search Console um, mm -hmm. with either XML. Don't have, don't worry, you know, definitely. Hey, if you, the ping command's still working, still use it. I don't, I, like I said, I heard it was deprecated, but I don't, I haven't tried it. I still put XMLs in my robots.txt, even though my test said yeah, it was the least reliable way. I still put it in there because it, it, it doesn't cost anything. It doesn't eat. Just do it. And it, you know, yeah. it's, it's in there. Just, um, but yeah, it was, that was very interesting that, um, that, the, that Google, even though it was hit my robots regularly, it did not hit the XML that I submitted in the robots as, as, as regularly as I would have expected. Like I said, it took like three or four sure. days at least. Yeah, especially since, you know, that's robot.txt was like old school. You know, that was like the first, you know, we used to call it the, 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 the directive file. You know, when it all, this is what you wanted to have the bots follow and then go to the site type of thing. Um, it's also one of the things that I, it's amazing how many websites I audit that don't even have one still, you know, so it's, um but yeah, I, I, I again maybe I'm old school or whatever, but I make sure my robot.txt is pretty open. You know, definitely has the sitemap on it. Um, you know, I in WordPress I dis disallow the regular WordPress crap. But um, but then you know I, I used to do a lot more with robot.txt, and so until I, I started looking at other people's robot.txt. So I believe that one time my robot.txt was such a hindrance to the crawl that they just gave up because I had so many different, you know, stay away from this, you know, don't do this, you know, all this different stuff in this robot.txt file. And then I just, again, I minimized like three or four sentences and or three. Yeah, yeah that was it. So, but all right, cool. So we how did you, earlier about, I'm sorry, I was just gonna say, we were talking earlier about dates. And one of the things I want to put in there, you mentioned time and that's a hundred percent accurate. Google, I've noticed, is very sensitive to time zones. Mm -hmm. um, we actually, uh, about a year or so ago, had some problems with Google uh, putting our time, displaying our time properly in the search results. And we realized once we fixed our time zone, it magically fixed it. We were doing UT, uh, UTC. We changed it to Eastern, and immediately Google liked it. So it was – and I learned this from Ted. Actually, I think I learned it initially at, at spring training because uh, I was telling him about times and he was saying how difficult it is, how times are very difficult to code and process. Um, For sure. So that was, it's something you were mentioning about times. I think that's something that everybody should be, you know, take away from is like, get your times right. Cause Google mm -hmm. already has trouble with times. For sure. Yeah. I mean, Google, Google right now is having trouble with everything. Well, you know I mean? It's, <laughs> you know, I, I talk to them. I mean, I, one of the biggest questions I get is, you know, because I'm so big in on page and I'm such a believer in on page, how is the, you know, just the vomiting of AI content affecting that? And again, I think we have to make it easier for the bots to figure out what we want. It's, you know, I don't, I, I understand they're going after all the, just the information overload, spam crap. Um, but we're, we're all using AI. I don't know anybody that's not. So, you know, but it just depends on how you're using the AI side. Something I'm going to talk heavily about at spring training um, is basically how to organize your website. You know, Google I think themselves are using AI. Exactly. They're working with publishers to create mm -hmm. AI news content. This is on the heat. This is before a year before they started this a over a year ago, and they just yeah. it's like, oh, mass AI content, like Google. You're working with people to create AI content. So what, what do you mean this mass AI content? What's what's the what's the definition of mass content then? Ten pages, a hundred pages, a thousand pages. Um, exactly. <laughs> yeah. And and that's the whole thing is that you know I mean I we're still kind of at least on our side we're still kind of dipping our toes in, you know. Um, like I did 10, 10 or ten blog cluster yesterday. We're doing more clustering writing content now than anything. Um, but I think the idea is, is still, you know, is it helpful? You know, is it going to answer queries that people are looking for? Or is it just fluff content? You know, 
you know, why do you need a green hot water heater? Well, yeah. is that even a search <laughs> term? You know, so um, anyway, so yeah, I think it's, but I think it's, you know, on the enterprise side, part of the AI, are you guys dealing with the AI video imaging type stuff that gets thrown into your kind of your sites throughout the, you know, how are you guys monitoring AI? Good so, AI compared to yeah, bad. So, so yeah, AI is one of those things that, I, you know, and I started championing this a while ago internally. It's like, look, AI needs to solve a problem. AI, mm -hmm. should, AI is not the solution in and of itself. It's the solution to a specific problem. And yeah. so we started looking at it that way. One of the things we have a team that looks at how to do our headlines, just our on-site headlines. Not even I'm not even talking about title tags or the headline on a page, but when you land on the homepage of a website, now mm -hmm. you have to think you have to think about it. so a user lands on our homepage. Now you have all these articles competing for that user's attention. So we've we've actually spent a lot of time using AI to figure out what is the best article to pull, what is the best headline to pull somebody in. Um, so like th simple things like that. When we do, when we do distribution of our content to other places, you know, maybe we can have AI rewrite the rewrite the headline or the title tag or the meta description. You know, make it look a little more unique. I mean, we can do things like that where mm -hmm. we're not we're not changing articles. AI is, we're just trying to make sure that we're we're AI is doing things that a human couldn't practically do. A human being couldn't go through every one of our headlines and make it a little more clickbaity. That's just not practical. Um, but AI <laughs> could do that. For we sure. don't do anything with images. Um, we deal pu purely with Getty images for all of our imagery. Um, okay. I think that's just kind of a corporate standard. Um, and, and video, all of our video, I mean, we've got the channels, so we've got more video than we'll ever know what to do with. Um, oh, for sure. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah, so that's, um, I, I, I've been trying to get the team and it. This is, you know, this is a bigger issue. My, my goal is I want I want to get AI transcripts of everything and summaries. And, and like, that's, like, that's a great place where we could get a summary of a video clip having a For person sure. it, it doesn't make it less valuable it, it and it's no different than what a human being could do if i sat down and wrote a summary it's going to be no better no worse than what an ai could do so i think those are places where ai could really be helpful yeah i agree i mean it's just it's got a lot of great things with it you know um one of the questions um came up you know how did i how did i set up my cluster and stuff and we and at least with Solterra, and i actually taught this at um dory's event last year is um, we personalize chat GPT to the client, you know, very, very specifically, you know, all the way down to <clears throat> not just who they are, where they're located, what their goals are, what's their expansion goals. You know, I mean, these 20 questions that we have all of our clients fill out to feed chat GPT, then you can write content. You can, you know, write clusters about content, depending on how you do it through prompting. Um, and it's, and it's really, really accurate content. So, um, so we stick it through Grammarly pro, we send it to the client for approval and we were amazed if we get more than five corrections on 10 pieces of article, it's just, it's that accurate because we've, the client gave us the information to feed it. So, um, and we can change the voice, you know, I might go after one article, you know, might be in a voice of empathy because you know they're hot we did a blog about a hot water heater you know not really exploded but kind of just water everywhere you know so um so we did it in an empathy voice and that was kind of interesting because it made it sound like you're a sad sack but we had to go back and, and kind of play around with that but um but i think yeah we're a huge chat gpt4 company um right now especially so just because we figured out early in this game that Otherwise, it's just a big scraper unless you personalize it. Yeah. So no, your presentation was great at Rock Stars, and I I, I took away took away a lot of things, and I used, utilized your, your prompt templates quite a bit uh, for clients when I, who do, who are trying to do a lot of blogging, and and they were mm. just all over the place. I'm like, no, here's you know your 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 direction was perfect because it showed you know here's how you focus everything in, here's how you make sure that you can scale it, you can scale the creation. It, I don't even use it for the writing of the blogs, but it's just like, what should we write about the, the exactly. outlines? It's, it's great for, for coming up with ide ideation outlines. And, mm -hmm. and then also you can, you can, you know, you had the whole thing with the topics and the entities and, and I don't want to give too much of it away, but you had, yeah, you had, you had great ideas and, and we've, it's, it's, I can hand it off to someone now and actually give them a, a system. Like here's the system you want to use mm -hmm. so that, you know, now the writers don't have to guess. They don't have to come up with things on their own. They have something they can follow. And that's yeah. where I like using AI because I don't have it right, but I will have it help me ideate and create outlines. No, exactly right. I mean, you know, we're 
our content for our clients now went from two to four a month to 10 plus, depending on the client. And because we're looking at content a different way, just because we're query based. I mean, I'm, I'm all about queries. You know, how are people searching for that keyword? Don't just write the keyword. You know, what are, what's the people also ask? What are all these things that Google's giving people credit for? That's what you should be writing about. So, um, and then break it out to see, Hey, can I write more about this? You know, can I expand on this query or question or thought, you know? So, and then you just start seeing, you know, Google's just eating that stuff up, you know, cause they're all interlinked together. Um, kind of like the, you know, hub of a, or a bicycle wheel, they're all linked to interlinked together and they all link to the main page you're writing about. So, um, and we're seeing just great results with that and it's an upcharge. So we definitely, it's not like we throw it back in there. We say, Hey, you know, Mr. Plumber, let's do a, let's do a 15, you know, 15 cluster around hot water, um, tankless hot water heaters or whatever. So. And you're creating uh, great value for them too. I mean, that's the key. Oh, that's, sure. that's the key. You can use AI to create more value as yeah. as an agency, as a consultant, and that's and that's what these companies need. They they need somebody to come in and just just take care of this. Just make this mm -hmm. thing right for me. And that's the you know, and I, you're, I mean, you're exactly right. And it's just you know the but you have to. We also share the um, the chat link with our clients so they can write and do stuff. Um, I'm helping one of our clients write a book through Chat GPT. Awesome. Um, you know, it'll do all kinds of stuff. You just have to be creative of what to feed it. So, um, you know, when I did the rock stars things, I came up with a whole storyboard for, you know, YouTube videos and all this stuff through just this chat GPT thing. So, um, and we, we haven't, you know, full disclaimer, I haven't played with Claude and all the other most popular ones. I just, I'm the type of person that I pick one and I master it. So, you know, so, and now we're getting ready to do the image side. The image side is a whole different rabbit hole. So that that is, yeah. I've been using images for my own personal sites, and mm -hmm. it's funny, like I, it's funny that you, you have to be very. So first of all, I, I feel like I need now I need to take a lesson in like photography one hundred and one because something I've realized, and I learned, and actually I learned this at, at the Rock Stars as well, that if you use the right terminology, mm -hmm. uh, AI knows what you're talking. So if I say I want a you know postmodern full face, 50% lighting headshot of Terry Sam. Like it no, and I can, <coughs> I'm kind of making these terms up, but AI knows what I'm talking about. For sure. Um, you know, I want, you know, I want a 10% lighting angle deflection or I, again, I'm making the words up, but like these, those words, it knows what, you, and if you can explain it in those terms to the AI, your content mm -hmm. will come out significantly better as opposed to, I want a picture of a crazy guy sitting on top of a car. You know, at a, you know, with zombies all around, like yeah, it's just going to kind of figure out what it wants to do. But if yeah. you can, if you can explain it in the way that a photographer or artist would explain it, the content's much better. Uh, I have noticed that AI gets fixated. I've mm -hmm. <laughs> there was one I used the term. I wanted a, a crazy, a wide-eyed, crazy-looking 1800s prospector type. That was one of the people yeah. I wanted in there. And AI insisted on putting gold nuggets in his hand. And I kept wow. telling AI, don't put gold nuggets in his hand. And it kept putting gold nuggets because I use the term prospector. Exactly. And AI knows that prospectors look for gold. And so there yeah. was no way I was going to get away from that. So yeah, you have and to maybe, maybe you maybe should have prompted like, you know, give me a picture of a broke prospector. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. I gave up. I said, fine, he's going to have a gold nugget in his hand. <laughs> Just give yeah, up. Exactly. My website has an old guy with a, with a gold nugget in his hand, has no purpose for being there but i couldn't mm -hmm. get ai to take it out yeah and it's uh and you know um chad michael's doing all the seo spring training player images those things are just freaking awesome and yeah um, and he's gonna teach people how, at the tech day how he does all that so it's um chad's one of my one of the people that we definitely follow for images it's amazing so chad's stuff. awesome i just follow him for anything whatever Chad yeah, says sure. i'll do that yeah, <laughs> yeah definitely so well how did you hear about spring training last year Oh, so I've known about spring training for a couple years. Um, so I, I started getting really sick of the standard uh, conferences. So for years, for a decade, I'd done the, you know, the SMX, SMX mm -hmm. East, SMX Advanced, and the PubCons and the MozCons. And and I started getting to the point. So number one, that a lot of them started getting real pitchathons. Like it was yeah. just nothing but people just pitching constantly. People were saying the same things constantly. You know, you'd go to one event. I, I tried mixing up the events and because we were doing the same thing year after year after year. And then tried to mix up the events and that worked 
a little bit, but then people start, and then I noticed around the same time, people started just taking the same things. And so I'm like, I gotta, and, and not to, it sounds egotistical and arrogant, but I wasn't learning anything. I'm like, how do I gotta go to people that are talking about things that I just don't know anything about. And yeah. um, so I started, and this what happened right before the pandemic. I started saying, what else is out there? And I, I heard a spring training and then I heard a rock stars and I heard some of these other events. I'm like, wow, I need to, you know, I need to start going to these. And then the pandemic hit and then no one was going any place. And, and so I knew about spring training for a couple years. I know the, the guys on the uh, uh, fight club talked about it. Um, so yeah, I guess it was last year. Uh, I said, Oh, wait a minute. You know, everybody was back up to going to places. No one wore masks anymore to go to places. I was mm -hmm. like, this is awesome. Let me start going places again. And, and this is what I want to go to. And, and it was awesome. Cause I got a chance to obviously to meet you guys and, and, and meet, actually meet everybody. It was, everyone was really, yeah. very nice. And, and so that's something I would, I would, recommend to anybody who's going to spring training if you're just going as an attendee and even if you don't have like a vip do not hesitate to just walk up and talk to any of the any of the uh speakers um yeah we're all you know we're all a bunch of introverts so you know it's, <laughs> it's just i try yeah. to break myself of that habit um but you know just feel free to talk to any of us i mean i'm always happy to talk to anybody about anything um and um, yeah, just you know, don't mm -hmm. don't be afraid. Everyone's really, really nice and really, really cool to talk to. And, and obviously, you know, met you guys right away, and it was really nice to meet you guys. And um, all right, Sean, yeah, it was uh, you know, it was funny because when we got when we when we got your form that you signed up last year, we're like, oh my gosh, somebody from Fox Business. You were that was when you were with Fox Business. You hadn't been promoted yet. Now, well, congratulations on your promotion. Thanks. <laughs> um, but um, we were like, oh wow, we got somebody because. One of the things as, as conference hosts is you try to get people from, you know, outside your little circles, you know, and, you know, this is our fifth one. So obviously we've got a following as far as, you know, our circle, but then you start seeing, oh, wow, we got a guy from Fox. And then we got last year we had, you know, two lawyers, two local lawyers show up that they wanted to do their own marketing. So, you know, so you figure out and you try to figure out, okay, wow, this is cool. So, and I, that was the first question I asked you is, how did you hear about it? You know, and so that was intriguing. You know, is it, did you talk about it at your Fox meeting? <laughs> Actually, I did. I did a whole presentation to the team. It's like what I learned. Because I took away a lot of great things, even the things that weren't SEO specific. So you had a lot of you had a lot of good speakers last year that talk about other things other than SEO, talk about organization and, and whatnot. Mm -hmm. I found those just as helpful. Um, and, and actually, interestingly enough, I ended up having a whole separate Kind of like you know group meeting with with my with the product team um about some of the things that you know is organization dealing with you know dealing with so from an agency you have to deal with clients well internally mm -hmm. we i have internal clients and you know we i found that very very helpful in communicating to folks communicating to devs and whatnot saying look you know when you get people giving you a pushback it's not because they're trying to hassle it's because they don't just they still know what's going on they you know exactly. here's how you help them stay in the loop so to speak and, and i found that just as helpful as any of the seo stuff oh well, for I've sure i've also realized yeah. oh yeah sorry good yeah you know, just especially dealing with devs yeah so um yeah. that's one of the hardest things well i mean i'm talking devs that aren't on your team you know so you know my my big client that i had i had to have everything submitted by the 20th of every month it would go to committee. They would tell me what was approved and what wasn't approved. And, you know, I mean, it was just, you know, it was, I don't know. <laughs> like, what do you mean this isn't approved? This is simple. Yeah. You know, well, they didn't understand it because I wasn't the one talking to them. There was a third party or a middle person talking to the devs. And so, yeah, that was one of the frustrating things. from. But also to... communicating upwards and downwards. Like, so mm -hmm. I'll speak to, you know, uh, an executive vice president or something like that. Now, this person, they're running around constantly. They do not. They do not want me to get into the weeds because getting in the weeds only it, it just wastes their time. They just need to know. And, and really, one of my big takeaways was you have to make sure. When ultimately, when you're done speaking with anybody, client, internal, external, you, you're leaving them with an emotion. You're leaving mm -hmm. them with a feeling. They're not going to remember the facts, but they will remember. Was I comfortable? that Elizabeth knew what she was talking about. Was I yeah. comfortable that Terry had a plan going forward? Um, was I comfortable that Charles, while he had problems, was working on fixing the problems and knew what he needed to do? That was, that's really the ultimately what you need to leave a client or internal or internal client with is mm -hmm. they need to feel comfortable with you. And, and everyone's had it. Everyone's had someone, you know, you take your car to the shop or maybe you have someone come to look at your house and do some work on something. And, and when it's all done, are you really, is it, the fact that they explained the problem wasn't what wasn't really what helped you. It was, did I feel they were confident? It was always a feeling they're left with. And that was something that 
I think that all of us need to learn more. It's easy, you know, because we're all kind of nerds. It's easy to get in the weeds and, and start talking all the details. And that's not so much. And that makes people nervous because they don't know what you're talking about. They don't understand it. And now you, you're leaving them with a question mark and you're leaving mm -hmm. them uneasy. And that's never a good position for a client or, you know, again, internal or external uh, or, or downwards. You have people, so I have teams I manage, you have to be able to explain to folks, hey, here's why we're doing things. It's really easy to say, why don't we just fix these XML sitemaps and make them perfect? It's like, you're right, we could, but let's look at how much time and energy we would require. Would we really get that much? There's a lot of juice out of that squeeze. So you have to always yeah. explain, here's why, you know, oh, we're, we're short people. We just need to hire more people. You're right, we do. But there's a whole legal HR thing going on right now, and we can't for these specific reasons. And now we're really in a weird, a weird spot. And you know, the new fiscal year doesn't start for another two months, so we might as well wait for two months. Unfortunately, you know, it's like you have to, you have to be able to explain at the people's level, either at a high level or, or low level. Like, here's what's going on, and here's why the why, and make sure people mm -hmm. understand. That, okay, and again, it's always boils down to the same thing. Okay, Charles is working on it. You know, we we trust him, and that's really ultimately what you got to make them leave with that feeling that. You know, you've got your you've got it handled. Yeah, for sure. Now, um, so you're do you have to deal with your obviously Fox site being attacked? I mean, whether it be you know trying to inject something or you know you 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 have to be on radars out there to say, hey man, if I can hack into Fox, man, I'd freaking get the trophy on my shelf. And, <laughs> do you have to deal? Do you see stuff like that and deal with stuff, or do you guys have a separate security? So the, yeah, the, the the good news the good news is or the bad news is yes, everybody is, is gunning for our sites. We're a, we're a large site, and mm. I've learned over the last couple of years that there are some people that don't like Fox. I go you know go go figure. There are some people that don't like us and and, and think we're evil. So you know the, so you've got that going on too. So you've got the regular hackers, and then you've got the then you've got people that have a, have a vendetta. Uh, so that's the bad news. The good news is we have a uh, we have a whole team that worries about that. I don't have to worry about it, fortunately. Uh, very smart, very hardworking guys. Um, and uh, so yeah, they they keep an eye on stuff. With that said, stuff still sneaks through. Uh, so for yeah. example, I know there's been articles written recently about that slash one thousand spam that. That mm -hmm. John Mueller just completely dismissed. I don't think he should really be dismissing. Um, I'll, I'll say talk to Ted if you want to know more about that. He definitely has a good eye yeah. on this stuff. But uh, we get that stuff. Like I looked at our I looked at our logs and immediately like, yep, we're getting it. Um, and but I looked at it, I'm like, okay, it's just not to a level that we have to worry about. I pointed it, I pointed yeah. it out to our to our team and said, hey, when you see this kind of stuff, you know, this is just as garbage and this is what they're trying to do, and and um, then they can handle it. Then they can, you know, they can create a, a template that takes care of it. But they got to be careful. They can't just say, you know, block anything that's going to a slash 1000 because we might have pages that just happen to be named slash 1000. So it, it's all these weird, you know, so it's a lot more ends up being a lot more complicated. Um, yeah. But, you know, but we have a team that gets to worry about it. So I, I don't have to fret over it. Yeah. Well, one of the first things I asked you was, you know, is your job offensive or defensive? And, you know, and it, what was your what's your answer? It might have changed from a year ago. So yeah, hopefully I answer it the same as I answered it when we talk. <laughs> I would say that about 30% of my job is risk management internally, though. It's okay. not even worrying about somebody hurting our site. It's making sure we don't hurt ourselves. And, okay. and I can't tell you how many times I, I have a guy that literally once every once a month or once a quarter, I think we have it at yeah, once a quarter, he reviews all the templates to make to see what changed in our template. Oh, someone released something a month ago that changed, you know, that changed this. And now our page load differently. And they didn't even think to talk to SEO about it. They just figured okay. it had nothing to do with SEO. Fortunately, most people will come to SEO and say, hey, is this an issue? Should we be concerned about this? Sometimes things just have to be done. Um, recently, we decided to gate content, meaning, you know, if you, so if you go to foxnews.com, there's a good chance you're going to have to give an email address now to start seeing certain articles. Um, that's a problem. <laughs> like yeah. if you're going to block Google. That's a problem. We we actually had an issue where someone decided, oh, we're going to gate the first debate, and they didn't check with me because they didn't think it had anything to do with with SEO. What they didn't realize is by gating the page, the video page, they were essentially blocking the search engine. Um, mm -hmm. so we had a problem during one of our debates uh, long ago, um, but you know we fixed that, and I was able to explain to me yeah, that that's an impact. So so there's that. Yeah, thirty percent of the job is just how do we. 
Uh, how do we protect ourselves from ourselves? I would say another 30% of the job is how do we make the system better? Go, going back to what we talked about earlier about well, I can't customize individual pages with schema. So how do I set up a schema system for our articles that will work you know, across all of our articles? It may not be sure. perfect, but it will work every place. So there's that, there's that enhancements. And then yeah. there's the fixing things that are wrong. Like, okay, all of our sitemaps, all of our sitemaps, for example, are, are, are um, alphabetized. You know, we don't want mm -hmm. them alphabetized. We want them sorted by by last mod date. Or, uh, oh, we're not using, you know, we're using UTC dates and not Eastern time, for example. Mm -hmm. That's another simple example of how we can fix things that are, quote, unquote, broken or not optimal for SEO. Uh, yeah, exactly. That's awesome. Now, do you guys have any um, talk communication responsibility to the local Fox News websites? So, yeah, so there are about 20 some odd uh, local affiliates. Some of them are, are owned by us, some of them aren't. So, like, for example, um, Fox LA, uh, Houston, Tampa, uh, Seattle has one. Those are just a few I know ones I've worked with off the top of my head. Um, and so we work with them and they are on the same platform. And so what I do is I work with them and I work with the lead there to be like, okay, here's what we want to change on the platform. So the lead's like, all right, what's the first? So they, they hired actually a guy recently who's, who's, who's really sharp and he's like, okay, what's the first thing? I'm like, okay, number one, let's get, you know, let's get this taken care of. All right. Do you have an RSS feed? Are they submitted to Google publisher? I'm like really day one kind of stuff, but like, mm -hmm. let's, you know, and that's what you have to do. You always, you know, even though it's a large site and even though we're dealing with 20 plus sites, it's like, all right, step one, what do we do? Let's take care of this. And then we take care of this. And then we take care of this. And it's, it's not, it's not hard stuff, but it can get real complicated because of the scales you're dealing with. Yeah. Kind of like what Elizabeth preaches is consistency in the communication. So, yep. so you don't have a Fox news in Butte, Montana reporting something different than regular Fox news. Yeah. So yeah. my, my job's a lot more lately been making sure that all of our different sites are using the same systems, using the same processes, using the same be best practices um, to the point where I even communicate now, you know, Fox is a large company. So we had like New York Post and I, I talked to them, TMZ, you know, we're all part of kind of the same thing. So I talked to the guy from TMZ. He's, he's a blast to talk to. Um, uh, shout out to Javon uh, if, you're, if you're watching. But, uh, you know, it's the, you know Tubi, <laughs> Tubi's owned by us too. So, you know, that, you know, so I talked to, I talked to the guy who works there, Angel, he's, he's great too, but, um, and so we're always communicating and helping each other out as much as possible. And I can tell them, hey, here's what I've seen on our side. You might want to consider this. And then they might have seen things themselves. And be like, hey, we saw this over here. And I'm like, huh, that's really cool. Maybe I can implement it across all the all the, all the new sites. That's cool, man. What a what a chore is it? And your pro your job's probably never boring. No, I never get bored. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not just saying that because we're on we're on video. I, I definitely yeah. do get bored. <laughs> no pressure. It, yeah, exactly. So, Elizabeth, do you have any questions for anything that you want to talk with Charles about? Um, you know what? I really like your your systemic approach to managing everything because, like you said, it's a huge animal and there's a lot of moving parts and pieces. And so I know that sometimes, like, because you're corporate, you've got a lot more to deal with than maybe like a smaller agency. But I think a lot of smaller agencies can take that kind of approach in managing their own systems and processes it's like okay how do you eat that elephant one bite at a time you can't tackle everything all at once so let's evaluate and look at big picture what's the whole entire thing and then what are the parts and pieces that we can attack to get everything under control and so i i definitely respect that about you that you do have like the big global picture but then you can also see the tiny details yeah, I think there is so much that the that the large, you know, these large conferences, you know, like, you know, again, like the SMXs and, and the SEO Spring Trains can learn from each other. I think there should be a lot more cross pollinization. Actually, lately, I've been thinking maybe I need to try to get myself into one of the SMXs and say, hey, here's what I've learned working with the quote unquote black hat community. Because that's the thing. Any small age, any small conference is immediately labeled black hat. And that's like, yeah. that's, first of all, that's not fair. It's not true. It's not accurate. And and you know what i learned and this is one of the reasons why i was very interested in doing things like spring training is that you know you folks have to deal with things that i don't have to deal with you have to figure out how to send a signal to the search engine that i don't have to figure out how to send but often you folks are much better you talk so someone like a Mar like a mike marlino he, like, he's figured out all these specific things you've got to send to the search engines to make them respect you and understand like, okay, this is an important business. And there's a lot of us large organizations, we're not sending these signals or if the signal's mm -hmm. being sent, it's being sent 
accidentally or by default and not intentional. And there's a yeah. lot of things I've learned that we can do um, on the enterprise side a lot more intentionally that will really, really give us more powerful. Unfortunately for smaller companies now, it makes us even more powerful. It's going to push you guys down a little bit, but but there's lots <laughs> we can learn from each other. I think that, yeah, organization, yeah, what we do organizationally, whether you've got one, if you've got only one client, so if you're a consultant or an agent, you've got one or three or four or five clients, great. But if you want to get bigger, you need systems. Um, yeah. If you want to get to, you know, a hundred clients, or if you want larger clients, if you want to go, hey, I have these small, you know, I have these plumbers, and I love this, but let me start getting some medium size, maybe from larger companies. You're going to make sure you need to be able to scale, um, mm. and you know, hopefully, I can pass a lot of that knowledge on to everybody. But here's how you can scale your business. For sure, hundred percent, and that's so important. And then you also have to look about, okay, so. Yeah, I mean, this, I have all these local plumbers. I'm going to go now over here to maybe this franchise or whatever. And now all of a sudden, boom, I don't have access to the back end of their website to do stuff. Yeah. You know, now I've got to go through a process to even see if I can get stuff approved that's normal. Yeah. You know, so, yeah, it's uh, when you decide to go down that road, it things change in different directions. It's not just about getting more money per month. Yeah, so, and, and you, you start getting pushback in ways that you would never expect. Um, exactly. I know, uh, so <laughs> I was speaking with Lee at a conference and he just loves this story. When I was, when I was working for Verizon, uh, phone calls to our technical support are very expensive. So mm -hmm. we wanted to reduce phone calls. So the solution was, let's just take the phone number off the website. And it's like, no, that's not the solution. And the problem was they took the phone number off the website, Google just started grabbing another number. And the question was, how do we make Google not put a phone number? And it's like, guys, you know, a quarter million people a month were searching for our phone number. Google's going to put a number there. So it's like you're going yeah. to start getting, yeah, you start dealing with a, you know, a franchise. <laughs> you start, you're going to start getting questions you've never gotten before. And you're going to get people coming from, at you from a position of like, hey, we need to reduce this cost or we need to mm -hmm. change this. Or we're worried about brand management, not so much about traffic. We need to make sure our brand is being cared for properly in the search engine. And so you end up having to approach it very, very differently. Yeah, 100 percent. And it's, you know, I mean. We preach brand on a little level, you know, where you guys have to preach brand on a mass scale, you know, globally, yeah. you know, um, you know, same and, with, you know, you and I talked about Verizon and Verizon's big problem was the global reach. Yeah. You know, yeah. They have and, billion, they spend billions of dollars on their brand. Maybe not billions of dollars, but definitely millions of dollars on a brand in, in a year. Um, making sure you rank for your brand name. Whereas all of us think, oh, that's no big deal. It's, you know, rank for the brand name. But to them, that's very, very important. What shows up when you search brand? If you search, when we did, so we did a migration from Verizon Wireless over to Verizon.com, Verizon Wireless.com over to Verizon.com. That messed up Google. One of the things we learned is that when you search Verizon Wireless, the, the knowledge panel got messed up. And that yeah. was a big deal because that's a powerful brand. Uh, and it was very visible. So you had CEOs seeing this, you know, board members seeing this and flipping out. Um, and like little things like that, it's like, yeah, you've got to make sure you care for all these little things and, um, and, and handle it because it's, there's a lot of money behind these brands. Oh yeah. hundred percent for sure. So what are you going to talk about at spring? Oh, sorry. Well, Elizabeth, it's a small company. They may not have millions behind it, but that's their livelihood. So I, I don't take that lightly, especially doing site migrations, you know, building new sites for clients. You know, even if you are Joe the plumber down the street, I'm going to take as absolute careful care of your URL structure and your rankings as, you know, any any large company, because that could be death for a company, a small yeah. company. And for a yeah. small company, your brand, that's your that's the word of mouth uh, advertising. That's really what we all we all want to attain what Amazon's attained. No, but very few people go to Google and then go to Amazon. Most people go straight to Amazon. They, they bypass Google and go right to Amazon. That's really what every company wants to get to. They bypass yeah. Google completely and just come straight to my website. Or worst case scenario, search my brand name in Google to come to my website. They're looking for me specifically. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, that's awesome. So what are you going to bless us with at spring training this year? So you were talking, you were mentioning traffic a little bit earlier, mass amounts of traffic. And we were just talking about traffic, you know, like having people find you. There are types of traffic that a lot of folks aren't aware of, but can take advantage of. So specifically, I'm going to talk about Discover, Google Discover. It is, um, some people may not even know it exists. If you go into Search Console, there is a section for Google Discover if your site gets Google Discover traffic. Um, if your site is not eligible for it or just doesn't get anything, you won't even see it. You won't even know it exists, but it is a, 
a, a massive, massive amount of traffic that could be waiting for you there. It's a great way to, to, to build your site. It's a great way to build your brand. Um, and, um, you know, I, I want to make sure that there's that folks know that it exists and it doesn't matter whether you're Joe, the plumber down the street or whether you're Fox business or whether you're TMZ, you can get this traffic. And, um, the only warning I'm going to, I have, I've already did, done my outline. I have my last slide. My warning is it is fickle. It is real fickle traffic. Don't rely on it just it's 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 gravy it's it's the icing on top of the cupcake it's not it's not the cupcake it's not the meat yeah exactly no that's awesome and when i saw that topic on the site i was like oh that's freaking cool because i don't know anything about google discovery so um google discover but i do um try to get into and they've taken a lot of stuff away that we used to like google did you know so but I think that's going to be awesome to kind of show it. Do you think it's, is it a traffic thing you need to get to, to get that? Like a lot of things has to, you know, especially like even core, core web vitals, you have to have a certain amount of traffic to even get core web vitals. Mm -hmm. You know, you can't do a hundred hits a month and think that you're going to get core web vitals. You're not. So is, is that also that type of process you think that it depends on traffic so or can, can we force the issue? So discover is controlled. There are some technical things you have to do, but it really boils down to traffic and engagement. Okay. There are some ways that you can kind of prime the pump a little bit, put yourself at least in the running. Uh, it's like, Hey, I could potentially get, um, get stuff, but it really, it, it's think of, think of, you know, back in the day, it was like, I want to go viral on Facebook. And like, think of it like that. It's like, it's like writing viral stories. And there's a, there's a method you can use. There are things that will definitely help you. There are things that won't help you. There's things that will, you know, kind of keep you from ever showing up. So um, I'll give all those specific rules um, that, you know, here's, here's the way Google, here's what Google says. Here's what's been, I've seen in my experience. If I were going to do it, you know, if well, we do do it, uh, but when we do it, here's how we structure our articles to increase the chances of, of getting, uh, of getting that traffic. Oh man, that's awesome. That's so cool. So um and again it's you know a lot of people are are on the referral traffic bandwagon and they need to be you know um traffic from other sources than google serps is so important you know so we do we do display ads for traffic we do all kinds of stuff to try to get you know especially from bing and you know some other reddit and all this other stuff that you know that everybody else is now getting on board with and it's it's super important no. So that'll it's probably be 20, that'll be 2025. 20, if you have me come back, I'm going to talk about all the different kinds of traffic channels. It's so easy to get so focused on how am I in the maps or how am I on google.com? And you forget there's news traffic, there's image traffic, there's video traffic, there's traffic on YouTube, there's traffic on Bing, there's traffic on Yeah. Like there's all these traffic channels and we ignore them. We ignore them. I understand yeah. they're small, but if you could add a couple percentage points to each channel that starts equaling, that starts equaling money for a client, especially a small client. Or a large yeah. client because we can scale it. I agree. I mean, it's this, you know, and, and we, it's only been, I don't know, year and a half, two years. We've actually started looking at referral traffic and where it's coming from and how can we get more of it? You know, um, Michael, Michael Molino talks a lot about that is paying attention to your numbers and wow, we're getting a lot from here. Let's get more from here, you know? So, um, but yeah, no, that's awesome. That's cool. So, um, this year, everybody, in case you haven't heard, is a little bit different. So in the morning, um, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, we're going to have people live on stage in the big room. Um, and then in the afternoons, Friday and Saturday after lunch, we're going to have breakout rooms, mastermind breakout rooms. So there's going to be four of them. There'll be one for on page, one for AI, one for off page, and then one for everything else. So agency growth. Um, there's two or three different types of variables in the, the MISC room, I guess we could call it, but um, it is a different format. It's an, it's, it's format that we think is going to be more engaging for people. Maybe think it's going to be more personal. You're going to be able to go to the on-page room and see me speak about siloing and all this other stuff that I like to talk about and be able to ask me specific, you know, questions. I'm a whiteboard guy, so I'll probably be using the whiteboard. I probably won't use a, you know, PowerPoint presentation. So, um, but that's the difference of, you know, this year, this year also was three days, um, which is different than last year. We've been two days every other time, except for the digital. 
Um, so we, again, it's, it's providing more people, more value. The speakers stay on site, you know, just like last year, nothing's changed. So you get to, you know, find them in the bar, have dinner with them, do all kinds of stuff to build relationships and, you know, and really change your life. I mean, that's, uh, that's, I don't, I don't say that lightly. The people I've met at conferences, um, and my friends, you know, maybe even, I can even call them family. Um, they're, they're gold. You know, um, Charles knows like I do, I can reach out to any of these guys if I got a problem, you know, and that's, that's where you feel really comfortable in this business. You know, if I, I, you know, CBS wants to hire me or whatever, I'm Charles is the first person I'm going to freaking reach out to and say, Hey, you know, is this even a good idea? What should I negotiate? You know I mean? Cause if you go to that level, your contracts change your, you know, all that stuff goes all out of, you know, all out of whack. So, you know, make, you know, make friends with people that are in that space already. You know, what did they do wrong? You know, Hey, make sure you have this in your contract. I would have done this differently. So, but that's the kind of stuff. And I'm sure you're going to see Charles and Charles is going to talk to you about what he's going to talk about in 2025. <laughs> so, you know, in 2025, things might be completely different. Yeah, so, possibly. <laughs> um, but anyways, um, you know, we hope you guys can come to the come to the event. Um, we have our sponsors up there. Actually, I think we have one more to um, add. Maybe not. Yeah, yeah one more to add. I have one more to add. But also, I wanted to add, um, like, we've been to a few of the bigger conferences mm -hmm. that have like massive amounts of people. And one of the things that we look at intentionally is because so many of us are introverts and we are not like super social butterflies, we take that into consideration with the venue. We make sure that the, um, that the hotel knows that our people typically stay on site. Um, you know, they congregate around the bar because, you know, that's just who we are. But we make sure that the facilities, the hotel has places to hang out, um, for everybody who does stay on site so that you can have those conversations because we're not the type to go out to like a loud crazy bar and talk shop like we want the quiet areas you know let's hey i really want to pick this apart i want to understand how do you do this you know how how did how did it help your agency or you know how did you get an agency from a freelancer and then you know if you have a particularly sticky problem with a client how can you unstick it and so we want to make sure that the facilities have those opportunities. Yeah, for sure. hundred percent. And it's, uh, you know, it's very important that, you know, I, I tell people all the time that if you come to spring training for specific reasons or whatever, and you don't get those specific reasons, reach out to me and I'll make sure you do. So um, we also continue on the event after the fact. So, um, here and in the next couple of weeks, we're going to build the private Facebook group for this year and we will have AMAs after the event. We keep it going. You know, we want you guys to, you know, I mean, might sound kind of weird, but we want you guys to be part of our family and we want to help you through whatever you're struggling with. So, you know, but um, I think it's going to be, you know, one of the ones that you don't want to miss this year. We're very excited about the new format. Um and we've got one VIP ticket. We had one that um, had a flight problem getting here in time, but the VIP is the Yankees Diamondback game. We've rented a couple suites. Um, we did this the very first spring training. It was the Cubs and Diamondbacks. And, you know, it's still today is one of the you know most popular VIP events that people went to. So, um, again, hope you guys can make it. If you have any questions for us, reach out to us. If you have an agency and you want to bring a few people, Contact Elizabeth directly um, and she'll, you know, get you guys into a different ticket type system. But anyways, Charles, thank you so much for spending some Saturday morning with us. I guess it's Saturday afternoon for you. Um, well, it's been great. Thanks yeah. for having me. So it's awesome that you're able to do this on a weekend. But um, it's going to be so exciting to see you here in a few weeks. Um, and it definitely hearing about, you know, Google Discover. That's one of the coolest things. Oh, congratulations on being part of Fight Club now. That's awesome. Yeah, That's thank you very much. Cool. Well, so, you know, there, there's a great, there's, there's a, uh, a great um, takeaway for folks that a year ago today, I hadn't gone to spring training yet. I didn't really know anybody. Um, now I get to speak at spring training and I got invited. I got invited to you know, be part of Fight Club. And, and uh, so that's, I think that's a great example of how 
when meet people, talk to them, you know, everyone's really nice and, and share, don't be afraid to share what you know. And, and cause you may find that, you know, something that other people just don't know. And, and I went into this thinking, I don't know what these folks, they know so much more than I do and they can, they can do all this stuff. And I started learning, Oh, wow. Maybe I do know some things that people are interested in. And, and uh, so not only, you know, be, feel free to reach out to folks and ask questions, but also don't be afraid to share. Cause I think you'll find that you definitely have information to other people. Um, you can solve someone else's problem. For sure. Um, and as a bonus, um, you only find out this if you watch this video. If you watch this video and you say, hey, I saw you with Charles on Saturday, I'll give you my chat GPT, chat GPT SOP. So um, that's, a bonus, that's, right? a little, that's a little bonus. So but you got to go through the video. So I'm going to see how many people actually watch it. So, but, <laughs> um, anyways, and this is our fifth podcast. So it's pretty cool. We're going to be doing a lot of these. So anyways. Enjoy the rest of your weekend, Charles. Thank you so much. Um, you know, Thank have you fun know. up there in Jersey area. Um, go out and enjoy the wilderness. So. Not today. It's raining. <laughs> oh, it's raining. Okay. Yeah. All right. Perfect. Well, thanks, everybody, for joining us. Um, reach out if you got any questions, challenges, or problems. Um, and we will see everybody soon. Great.